The story of Scott Weiland's tumultuous life has been told before by many others. There's no denying the struggles that Weiland had with addiction, how this contributed to many self-destructive behaviors throughout his life, and how it ultimately claimed his life. Or did it? Today, we're going to look at Scott Weiland's death through a slightly different lens and pose a few lingering questions. Hi. I'm Andy, host of Poetic Wax, where I bring you stories from the history of bands and albums and songs within my vast record collection. And life has moved on, because you don't move on. Things just change. I feel like he really does not have the accolades and the respect and the recognition that he absolutely deserves. That was Jamie Weiland, Scott's widow, from a podcast released right here in 2024. As we mark the 30th anniversary of Stone Temple Pilots' landmark sophomore album, Purple, its impact on alternative rock remains undeniable. Released on June 7, 1994, Purple solidified the band's place in the 90s alt-rock pantheon with its blend of grunge and psychedelic rock and hard rock, featuring hits like Interstate Love Song, Vaseline, and Big Empty, the album showcased Scott Weiland's versatile vocals and the band's dynamic musicianship. Purple not only debuted at number one on the Billboard 200, but it also garnered quite the critical acclaim, proving that Stone Temple Pilots were more than just grunge imitators. Their ability to craft melodic yet edgy songs resonated with many, myself included. Even then, things were a bit rocky for Scott Weiland. In 1995, Weiland was sentenced to a year probation after a drug conviction, but instead of working to get clean, he moved into a hotel for a few months, which just happened to be right next door to Courtney Love. He claimed in June of 2015 that he had been drug-free for 13 years. Six months later, he'd be dead. He was just very, very loving. When he was on, there was nothing like being around him. In 2015, Scott Weiland was actively touring with his band, Scott Weiland and the Wildabouts, promoting their new album, Blaster, which had been released on March 31st of that year. The Wildabouts included Jeremy Brown on guitar until his tragic death in March of 2015, Tommy Black on bass, and Joey Castillo on drums. Nick Maybury would replace Jeremy Brown after his passing. The album marked a return to Wyland's rock roots and was intended to kind of re-establish his presence in rock music. Despite the ambitious tour schedule, Wyland's performances were a bit inconsistent, and reports often described his behavior as a bit erratic and his vocals as shaky, many attributing this to his ongoing struggles with substance abuse. And we'll get into more of that later. The tour covered various cities across the United States, with the band playing in both small clubs and larger venues. The intention was to kind of rebuild Wyland's reputation as a formidable live performer, but Wyland's struggles with addiction were evident during many performances, so people said. The death of guitarist Jeremy Brown from a drug overdose just a day before the release of Blaster cast a massive shadow over the tour, and it was a significant emotional blow to not just Wyland, but the entire band. No surprise. Fans remained loyal, but were often met with mixed experiences. Some shows demonstrated glimpses of Wyland's former glory, while others were marred by some unpredictable behavior. During one show in Corpus Christi, Texas, in April of 2015, well, let's just say that one garnered quite a bit of negative attention due to Wyland's visibly impaired state. Critics noted the potential in the new material on Blaster, but they were often quite critical of the live performances, highlighting concerns about Wyland's health and stability. Billboard penned a piece on the Corpus Christi performance, stating that, quote, Scott Wyland treated the audience to a cringe-worthy performance of the STP hit 
Vaseline, with the PRP opening their piece on the set with the following statement. Scott Weiland doesn't appear to be in the best shape. This is negative press, and other reports from this show indicated that his vocals were often off-key and his overall stage presence had declined quite a bit. Many others pondered whether or not he was back on heroin. And then there was the other, there was the Corpus Christi video. That was when he like was completely singing off pitch and everyone thought he was on heroin again. Again, it was medication. And what had happened was his in-ears had gotten wet. So he couldn't hear anything. He couldn't hear the band. And everyone immediately just jumped to, oh, look, Scott Weiland's on heroin again. The last leg of the tour continued into the fall of 2015. The band's final performance was in Toronto on December 1st, just two days before Weiland's untimely death in Minnesota. Let's look at a timeline of the events of December 3, 2015. That day, the band's tour bus rolled into Bloomington, Minnesota. They were scheduled to perform at Medina Entertainment Center in Edina, which was nearby. The show had been canceled uh, several days prior, but their next one was set for the 4th in, in Rochester, which was also relatively close. Wyland's tour manager, Aaron Moeller, was with the band on tour, and as the day continued, the band and crew went about their usual pre-show activities. Wyland told Moeller that he was going to take a bit of a nap, and he disappeared into the tour bus. He was reportedly seen by some crew members, but there was nothing really peculiar or alarming about his behavior at the time. That evening, the band was preparing for their upcoming performance, and Wyland was in his tour bus, which was parked outside the venue. His bandmates and crew were setting up inside, and the tour bus had, you know, your normal layout. You've got the bunks in the middle for members of the crew and other members of the band, and you had a bathroom and some seating areas and stuff like that. Then, towards the back of the bus was a room with a closing door, and you could have a little bit more privacy in there. Well, that's where Wyland had slipped in earlier to take a bit of a nap. And it wasn't unusual for Wyland to do this, to sleep odd hours of the day. So the band and the manager and all of the crew, they just let him be. At approximately 8 p.m., Wyland's tour manager, Aaron Moeller, tried to rouse Wyland and found him unresponsive. Black immediately called emergency services, and despite attempts to revive him, Wyland was pronounced dead at the scene at around 8.27 p.m. News of Wyland's death spread rapidly. Fans and fellow musicians expressed shock and sadness, and others weren't all that surprised. The band issued a statement expressing their grief, and tributes poured in from across the music community. Members of Stone Temple Pilots and Velvet Revolver, his past two bands, the latter including Slash and Duff McKagan, shared heartfelt messages about Wyland's influence and his legacy. His death marked the end of a troubled but immensely influential career in rock music. His passing was a significant loss to the music world, highlighting the ongoing issues of addiction and mental health that so many artists face. But of the death itself, was it an overdose? Or was it something else? So when we talk about the comments that people make about me, about Scott, about our marriage, I basically want to tell everybody to go fuck off. Because they weren't there. They didn't know. <laughs> It had been a lot, the months leading up to his death. In January of 2016, Billboard noted that Scott had been suffering from hepatitis C, likely contracted from years of drug abuse. He was dealing with mental illness, Wyland was bipolar, and struggling with the fact that both of his parents had cancer in the final months of his life. There was Jeremy Brown's death the day before the release of Blaster, and the ongoing mental struggles due to falling out with his children, paranoia, and the sexual abuse that he had experienced as a child, not to mention a ton of other things. Shortly after his death, Wyland's ex-wife, Mary Forsberg, wrote about his addiction, its impact on the children, and the callousness of the music industry, stating that the children, quote, lost their father years ago, and that, quote, what they lost on December 3rd 
was hope. Despite the discovery of drugs in Weiland's system, no underlying cause of death was immediately given. The Hennepin County Medical Examiner's Office conducted the autopsy, which later confirmed that Weiland had died of an accidental overdose of cocaine, ethanol, alcohol, and MDA. The toxicology report also indicated that Weiland had heart disease and asthma, which may have contributed to his death. In June of 2024, Weiland's widow, Jamie Weiland, spoke to the Appetite for Distortion podcast to set the record straight. You've heard some clips from it before, and here's another one. When he died, everybody was kind of like, that's tragic, but of course, he overdosed, which he didn't fucking overdose, which I try to get that point across. He didn't. Because he had drugs in his system, the coroner had to rule it an overdose. But the truth is Scott died because the main artery in his left ventricle was 95% blocked. That came from 10 years of heroin use. That came from an entire adult life of chain smoking. It was his, his heart stopped. Did he have trace amounts of drugs in his system? He did. So was it an overdose as so many, including the coroner claim, or was it a heart attack? due to a cocktail of underlying issues, one of them being years and years of drug abuse. Here's Forsberg in that article from Rolling Stone. Our hope for Scott has died, but there is still hope for others. Let's choose to make this the first time we don't glorify this tragedy with talk of rock and roll and the demons that, by the way, don't have to come with it. And when it comes down to it, that's the story I go with. There was no one closer to Scott than his wife, Jamie. And her recounts of the time leading up to his death are brutally honest. But one thing is clear, it was not an overdose. So in the case of Scott Weiland, I personally lean towards believing Jamie Weiland. While Scott had drugs in his system as well, potentially contributing to his death Scott Weiland died of a heart attack. Appreciate any opportunity I can to just let people know, you know, how truly wonderful he was and to clear up these misconceptions about him. He was sunshine and he was brilliance and he was kindness and he was love and he was hilarious and he was brilliant. Each week, you can tune in for another episode of Poetic Wax, where I pull albums from my vast record collection and dig into their history. Down in the description, you'll find links off to vinyl, to the references I use to pull together this, and to the clips featured in this video. Next, if you like Stone Temple Pilots, you might dig these stories right here. Once again, I'm Andy Fenstermaker. This is the Fence Post Vinyl Channel, and I'll see you in the next video. He's here. He's here. In some version, his energy is always with me.